to the head. He's in much more trouble this time, Steve, that I can assure you. Another left hook, and that's it. Throughout the program, we'll count down the remaining four until we reach the knockdown you voted as number one. But right now, we're going to bring you our most exciting fight. Of the 69 bouts Showtime Boxing has aired in 2001, it was difficult to choose just one. But with genuine animosity between the two combatants, four knockdowns in less than nine minutes, and a controversial ending, here's what we selected as the most exciting fight of the year. The championship elimination bout between former champ Charles Brewer and the powerful Antoine Eccles had been surrounded by personal incriminations and petty insults. And from the opening bell, both fighters went at each other with a fury that seemed more personal than professional. Just when one seemed ahead, the other would take control. Back comes Eccles. Back comes Brewer. As close to an even round as you want to get. Ebb and flow to this first round. After an extremely close opening round, the second turned into a lopsided affair. And a right hand, and down goes Eccles. There's the power shot. A right to the head. And Brewer looking to finish it here in the second. And a left uppercut on left hook, and down goes Eccles for the second time. Oh, big left just before the bell. Coming into the third round, it seemed Brewer was well on his way to a victory. But in the sport of boxing, everything can change with one punch. Now Brewer's in trouble. What a recovery by Eccles. Brewer's was held up in the ropes. They called it a knockdown. Oh, my goodness. A roundhouse right by Eccles and Brewer stumbling around. This is amazing. Talk about a street fight. Eccles all over Brewer. It's being stopped. Eccles, who was down three times in the last round, wins the fight. What an amazing, dramatic turnaround. With Eccles going down three times and Brewer only being called for one, many believe the stoppage was premature. But the controversy, along with nonstop action, makes Brewer versus Eccles our most exciting fight of 2001. In all of boxing, there's one division where the scrutiny is more intense, the attention more lavish, and the lights shine brighter. And for 2001, it also happened to be where the biggest upsets of our year took place. It all began with a relative unknown taking on the fighter many believed to be the best heavyweight of the 90s and making history in the process. Ruiz pushing Holyfield back, swarming. Straight right hand on the head by Ruiz. Holyfield's getting mad now, and so is Ruiz. Oh, there's a big right hand to the head. This round is Holyfield's clean, though. Look at all the blood. A flurry by Holyfield. Back comes Ruiz, though. And this has really developed into a compelling affair. would not register the only heavyweight upset of 2001. Clifford Etienne came into his fight with lightly regarded Frezzo Kendo with his sights set on a championship bout of the near future. Those plans would be surprisingly altered. Look at this. A clubbing right hand by Okendo. And he goes down again. And he goes down for a third time. Etienne missing with most of those shots. Oh, and another right hand. And Etienne is down again. ATN continues to swing wildly. He's not allowing Okendo to think now. Oh, a big right hand by Okendo. And ATN's down for the sixth time. And down he goes for the seventh time. 
And I'm not sure he can continue after this. That's it. That's all she wrote. While Okendo's exploits that night put him on the heavyweight contender radar, heavy-handed David Tua was already a top 10 contender. The Tua man was gunning for a second shot at the heavyweight title when he took on light-hitting but dangerous boxing technician Chris Bird. Tua would find out that while hitting Bird would be one thing, catching him would be something else altogether. And the pesky Chris Bird doing his thing, creating a smile from the Tua man. Oh, beautiful move by Bird to elude that right hand by Tua. There's a straight left that landed by Bird. Now he pecks away with the right. Tua jumps on Bird. He should not be looking for one big shot. Well, he got a good left hook there to the jaw, did Tua. Bird pecking away with the right hand. Tua looking a little shaky right here. Bird continues to score at will. David Tua in trouble. Tua takes Bird into the corner above us. That's it. And they are up here in Las Vegas. Chris Bird's remarkable performance elevated him to number one contender status and a possible shot at the heavyweight championship. Also gearing up for a chance at the title in 2001 was two-time heavyweight champ Mike Tyson. Making his third European appearance in two years, Tyson met hometown hero Brian Nielsen in Copenhagen, Denmark. There's the bell. And Tyson goes right to work. Big right hand to the head by Tyson, followed up by a left uppercut. Oh, quick combination of the head. And down goes Nielsen. Down for the second Seven. time in his career. Hey, I'm going to declare him the winner right now. All right, corner? Okay. Mike oh, you Tyson, you win. It's over. It's on. Tyson it's made on. sure that the upset bug that marked heavyweight boxing in 2001 did not sting him. With the exploits of Okendo and Bird and the dominance of Tyson, 2001 was quite a year for the heavyweights on Showtime. left hook and Earl Morton the referee not even waiting for the count Jeff Lacey with conviction Steve in 2001 one boxer fulfilled his quest to unify his division and become one of three current unified champions systematically and methodically this champion collected the other two titles in the 140 pound division in convincing fashion there is no doubt why he is the most exciting fighter of the year Kostyzu's first target was Shambe Mitchell, a tough southpaw out of Washington, D.C., and the holder of the WBA title. This is an alley fight. Shambe Mitchell's in with one of the best fighters in his division. And Zoo just doesn't let up. After seven rounds of action, Zoo forced Mitchell to quit on the stool with an injured leg, capturing his second world title. A few months later, Zoo faced rugged journeyman Akhtiar Kal. The fight proved tougher than expected. Pretty good left hook there, and followed by a right by Urkow. A lot of folks just thought that Zoo would come in and tear this guy apart. I'll tell you right now, if he throws a combination against Zab Jude and poses, he's going to get hit with a right hook. Back comes Kostya Zhu. He wobbles Urkow. Zhu outpointed the awkward Urkow, winning a unanimous decision. This win set up a showdown with IBF champion Zab Judah. That's all he got when he fight me in November. It's going to be a short night, you know what I mean? Talk of the matchup between Sue and Judah had been on the lips of fight fans for quite some time, and the tension of the air fight night was palpable. In the first round, Judah relied on his speed and ferocity to rock Sue several times. Nailing Sue here. Sue holding on. Look at the head movement by Judah, and then he comes through with a combination to the head. And wailing away with a left hook, continues to hit. Kasha Zhu cannot move straight back against that Judy. He's too quick. Sue looks to be in trouble early against the speedy Judah. Sue regrouped in the second round, slowing the pace and picking away at Judah. Nice right hand and left hook by Kasha Zhu, one of his better combinations. And a nice jab. This round was Kasha Zhu's clearly evening things up. Approaching the end of the round, Sue surprised his young nemesis. And 
Something's wrong. Down he goes. A right hand. He's in trouble. He's in real trouble. It's over. J.D. stops the fight in the second round, and it's one by Zhu. Unbelievable. Kostya Zhu, overall a three to one underdog, but able to uh, hold on to the belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With one punch, Kostya Zhu defeated a previously undefeated champion, unified his division, and put a dramatic end to his quest. And for that, he earns the title of most exciting fighter of the year. Tua has to be brimming with confidence. Another left hook down goes Dickelson. Can he get up from this one? He's not getting up from this nope. one, Steve. He's done. Flat on his back. It's over. Last year, Showtime solidified its status as a boxing superpower with the launching of Showbox, the new generation. Unlike Showtime Championship Boxing, where you see today's world champions and biggest superstars, Showbox focuses on the up-and-comers of the sport, the future of boxing. Here, for more insight, are Showbox commentators Nick Charles and Steve Farhood. Thank you, Steve. We're into our second season of Showbox, the new generation. My partner Steve Farhood and I have taken you ringside from New York City to Las Vegas, from Tacoma to Charlotte, across America and across the Atlantic to the United Kingdom. We've seen a blur of excitement and witnessed the rise and fall of a new generation of stars. Perfect case in point, Steve, our first show. Nick, before Leonard Doreen fought Martin O'Malley on our very first show. Who ever heard of him? No one. So he beats an undefeated fighter in O'Malley, gets another win, and then just a couple of months later, he's a world champion. So that is exactly the kind of progression we like to see on Showbox. So that show personified, that first show, what Showbox is all about. Hungry young fighters willing oftentimes to risk their perfect record for the chance to sparkle on national television. Well, look at the 2000 Olympians, Panchito Bojado and Jeff Lacey score the kind of knockouts that you don't forget. These were all-time highlight film knockouts. Also on Showbox, we had the featherweight Rocky Juarez, a lot less publicized perhaps than Bojado and Lacey, but he looks like he may end up being the best of the 2000 Olympians. We also introduced American fight fans to British junior welterweight, the unbeaten Ricky Hatton. Hatton's name brings a smile to my face instantly. Mm -hmm. Thrilling, he's going to be thrilling in victory. He's going to be thrilling in defeat should he lose. Tremendous puncher. There are prospects in all shapes and sizes and all countries as well. And we expect to be seeing a lot more of unbeaten welterweight slugger Kermit Sintron. Well, Kermit Sintron, for my money, is the poster boy for this show. No one knew who he was. He comes on our air, scores two knockouts. All of a sudden, every promoter in boxing is begging for his services. Every fight fan wants to see Kermit Sintron. So the stars of tomorrow on television today. We hope that Showbox, the new generation, has become the standard for boxing the way it used to be. Thanks, guys. Now, finally, here is your choice as the number one knockout of 2001. And ending strong, down he goes. A right hand, he's in trouble. He's in real trouble. A right hand upstairs and it's over just like that the year 2001 will remain a memorable one in the history of showtime boxing for with our record number of fights the year will be forever defined by its many enduring images and vivid memories to highlight some of those memorable moments let's have a look at the sights and sounds of 2001 <laughs> Left, right, and out on his feet appears to be. Down goes to Willie Field. Champion coming on. Down goes Soto. Oh, out of nowhere. Joe Calzaghe, still the super middleweight champion. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of boxing, we have. 
have a unanimous decision in favor of the winner. For me and all of our fans, 2001 proved to be one of the most exciting years in the history of Showtime Boxing. We brought you 69 fights, some of boxing's biggest champions, and a chance for you to see many of the stars of tomorrow. I'm Steve Albert. For my Showbox colleagues, Nick Charles and Steve Farhood, thanks for watching Showtime Boxing, a year to remember. The recent pair of well-publicized bouts between Vernon Forrest and Shane Mosley have dominated the welterweight division limelight. And with his unexpected victories, Forrest has become the premier 147-pounder in the sport today. Overshadowed by these dramatic wins and lost in the confusion of the rankings is another welterweight champion looking for recognition. He's Mexico's WBO title holder, Antonio Margarito. His exciting 10th round TKO over highly touted Antonio Diaz seven months ago earned the hard-working Margarito a well-deserved title. But now he's looking to be a star. Antonio Margarito next on Showtime Championship Boxing.
Welcome to Southern California. We're in Orange County, Anaheim to be precise, home of the Angels, the Cinderella American League wildcard entry, which upset the Yankees in the first round of the playoffs. It's also the land of the Magic Kingdom, Disneyland, but nothing Mickey Mouse about this fight card as our month-long festival of fisticuffs continues. Tonight, we're pleased to present a pair of world championship showdowns from the West Coast. In our main event, Mexican standout Antonio Margarito puts his WBO welterweight title on the line as he takes on number three WBO contender and Southern California favorite Danny Perez in a rematch of a close encounter won by Margarito back in 1999. And in our co-feature, a battle of undefeated little hands of steel. 31-0 Eric Burrell, the pride of Madison, Wisconsin, by way of San Juan, Puerto Rico, will risk his WBA flyweight crown against 20-0 Den Kauzen Kauwichit, the number one mandatory WBA contender out of Thailand. We bring you inside of the beautiful Arrowhead Pond, the home of hockey's Anaheim Mighty Ducks. This evening we trade hockey pucks for boxing gloves and what locals are proclaiming as the biggest ring roundup ever to hit this arena. A world championship doubleheader is coming your way. It's fight night in Anaheim. Hello again, everybody. Steve Albert ringside from the Golden State. Well, it's a catch-22 that dates back 100 years. To become a star, you have to beat a star. But how do you beat a star when none of the stars will fight you? Overshadowed by Vernon Forrest and Shane Mosley, the relentless and no-quit Antonio Margarito is viewed by the big-name welterweights as high-risk, low-reward. As a result, the world titleist is forced to defend against the likes of Danny Perez, a dangerous contender he's already beaten. More than three years ago, Antonio Margarito and Danny Perez met in a spirited eight-rounder in Indio, California. Perez scored a knockdown of the first round, but Margarito rebounded and grew stronger as the night progressed, ultimately winning by split decision. A huge difference tonight with a world title at stake. And with that, let me bring on my ringside partner, former world champion Bobby Chez. And Bobby, how frustrating is it for Margarito to be fighting a rematch like this? Well, Steve, considering that Antonio Margarito wants to become a big player at 147 pounds, wants to be considered one of the premier fighters up there, I think it has to be somewhat frustrating at the very least. The big fighters don't want to fight him, and the smaller fighters moving up. The risk-to-reward ratio is just not there. He's a tough fighter. He's got a great chin, throws a lot of punches, always in excellent shape. And, again, he's tough and can punch. He's never an easy fight. Nobody wants to fight him. That's got to be an awkward place to be. Well, where would you rank Margarito among the, the champions in the welterweight division? Well, it's no secret, after beating Sugar Shane Mosley twice, Vernon Forrest gets the number one slot. Right behind him, I do like Ricardo Mayorga, so slipping in the third spot, I like Antonio Margarito. The jury is still out right now on Michelle Picciarillo, the Italian champion, but we just don't know what kind of commodity he is. Right now, though, Sugar Shane Mosley could probably still be all of the champions, with the exception of Vernon Forrest, so to become a big part of that division, sit on top, Antonio Margarito's got a lot of work ahead of him. All right, Bobby, before we get to Antonio Margarito's first defense of the WBO welterweight title, the fighter called Little Hands of Steel will return to the ring following the longest layoff of his career, which is nine months. As we look in on Eric Burrell, who will defend his WBA flyweight title in our opening bout, history suggests that it's all but impossible for an American 112-pounder to be anything more than a flyweight on the wall. But Burrell has reigned as a world champion for more than two years. Roadblocks, some self-imposed, have prevented him from rising to the next level. There have been hand injuries, arrests for alleged drunken driving, and too little evidence of Morell's nickname, Little Hands of Steel. It's all been part of Morell's unlikely journey. I was seven years old when I started boxing in Puerto Rico. I discovered that I was good at when, when I went to the uh, 1992 Junior World Champion, Championships. We moved to Wisconsin because my brother was attending to the uni uh, University of Wisconsin and that's, that's how we, uh, all my family end up in Madison, Wisconsin. It was very strange. Uh, at first it was, it was hard uh, not knowing the language, um, the, uh, the winters and all that. I mean, it was extremely hard at first. Yes, I fought in, in the uh, 1996 Olympics uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and uh, right after that, we, I mean, I turned pro. And um, I'm 31 and old right now. 
Eric Burrell still fighting to prove that on the American oh. boxing scene, a little man can make it big. At age 27, he's seemingly at the crossroads. As we close in on our co-feature undefeated, Eric Burrell set for his fourth defense of the WBA flyweight crown against unbeaten number one contender yet virtually unknown Denkausen Kowichit of Thailand. Already in the ring, Denkausen Kowichit first time of the States over 200 Muay Thai bouts. An intense form of Thai kickboxing turned pro with a 12 rounder when the Pan-Asian belt his second fight 16 title defenses he can fight, but hasn't proven himself versus world-class opposition, although reports are he's better than former junior flyweight champ Saman Sorjatarang of Thailand, a successful fighter in his own right. Bobby, he said he'll challenge Morel fist to fist and toe to toe, but can he realistically deal with Morel's experience and superior boxing skills? You know, Steve, there's no doubt about the fact that Morel has better experience and also against better competition, but it's not going to be that. It's going to boil down to styles, skills, and implementing strategies. I personally think that Morel is not only too quick and a better boxer, but he has too much power, and I think he should dominate the fight. However, Kawich has been in over 200 Muay Thai fights. That has to lend itself to his toughness, and he's been in professional ranks here 10 rounds more than twice as much as Morel. So if this fight gets late and is reasonably close, it could be real interesting. Yeah, he is in great condition getting his first world title shot after six years fighting a dream come true, feeling the weight of an entire nation wants to win this for his beloved Thailand. And the champion, Eric Burrell, 96 U.S. Olympian set to enter for the first time in nine long months, feels his opponent boasts of face-to-face -face combat are a ploy to distract him from his game plan. San Juan for Madison, Wisconsin at 17 to join his brother attending the university there. Has had his difficulties of late, legal problems, inactivity, trouble with his right hand, although his power punch is the left hook, and criticism for his defensive style, though I thought he forced the action and was entertaining his last fight. Bobby, should Burrell ignore the criticism, keep doing what got him here, or go for the knockouts? Steve, I'm sure the criticism is bothering Eric Morell, but I'll tell you what, I guarantee you that if he loses, it'll bother him even more. You never fix something that's working. He's undefeated, and he's a world champion. That in and of itself says an awful lot. Now, certainly he might want to make some small, subtle changes and add to his style by working harder for the knockout, but that, and that's okay. But he has to worry about one thing first, winning first, being exciting second. Well, maybe he should just change his nickname, uh, Bobby. When people hear little hands of steel, they're expecting fireworks. High expectations from the fists of this young man. Let's check the numbers as we go to the tail of the tape. A mere one-year difference in age. A three-and-a-half-inch height advantage for Morell, who also has the three-inch edge in reach. And at yesterday's weigh-in, Morell right on the mark. And Kowicz is just below. Let's check the key rules for this championship affair. There's no standing eight count, no three-knockdown rule. A fighter cannot be saved by the bell in any round. If an accidental headbutt occurs before the end of the fourth round, the fighters rule they no decision. If it happens after the end of round four, they go to the scorecards. So here at the Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim, we are getting ready for Eric Burrell and Denkausen Kowichit for the WBA flyweight belt, set for the formal introductions from our ring announcer, Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and we welcome you to the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim, California as we have a big night of action coming away and it's all brought to you by Top Rank Incorporated in association with Showtime and the undisputed King of Beers, Budweiser. This world title bout coming away is sanctioned by the World Boxing Association. The president, Gilberto Mendoza, supervisor, Rodolfo Fortich. This is along with the California State Athletic Commission. Our judges scoring this bout from ringside from Cartagena, Colombia, Uriel Aguilera. From Montreal, Canada, Guy Jutras. From Sacramento, California, Terry Smith. 
And our third man in the ring working in this, his 70th world title bout, Raul Caiz. All right, fans, here we go. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Flyweight Championship of the World. Introducing to you first the challenger on my left. He is fighting out of the blue corner. Entering the ring wearing white trunks with multi-color trim. Joining us from Songkla, Thailand. He weighed in at a ready 111 and one half pounds. His record is undefeated at 20 wins, no losses. Eight of his wins coming by way of knockout. And he is ranked the WBA number one flyweight contender. Introducing Den Kaosan Kawichit. And his opponent across the ring on my right, fighting out of the red corners, the defending world champion. Entering the ring wearing red, white, and blue trunks, he is fighting out of Madison, Wisconsin, by way of San Juan, Puerto Rico. He weighed in at the flyweight limit of 112 pounds even. He is undefeated in his campaign to the ring as well, with 31 wins, no losses, 17 of his wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, he is making the fourth defense of his title. Here is the undefeated WBA flyweight champion of the world, known as Little Hands of Steel, introducing Eric Morel. Once again, Raul Caiz is our referee in charge. Now to give instructions, 12 rounds of action schedule. Okay, gentlemen, I give you instructions downstairs. Remember, obey my commands at all times. Keep your punches up, watch your heads. Remember, bone here, on up is okay. Both your trunks are a little high, okay? Here, up. Shake hands and good luck to both of you. Morel, who can switch to southpaw, basically fights from the outside, picks his spots, and sets up the big left hook. He may apply more pressure than usual in light of recent complaints of safety first. Here's the little-known little man, Kowichit, broad-shouldered, smooth, holds his hands high, but Morel claims that he drops them. He's in terrific shape, but lacks punching power. We'll see if he can cut off the ring, get inside, go get to the, the body, down. slow Morel down, and not get stung by Morel's dangerous left hooks. Box. Here we go. Morel comes right out, bombing. Morel went right at him as if he was the puncher. And I'll tell you what, he means to impress. Talk about turning up the aggressiveness and the pressure. Morel wasting no time. I think also as the champion, see what he did was come out and what test not only the heart, head? but the chin of the challenger. And right now, the chin held up pretty good. That was a pretty nice right hand. And he also knows from watching a rare tape that Kowichit is a slow starter. But right off the bat, Morel turning it on and testing the Thai fighter. And I'll tell you what, Kowichit is not starting that slow. He's come out ready to do battle, going to the body, working underneath, throwing a nice amount of punches early. He said he wanted to trade with Morel. Well, he got his wish because Morel forced the action from the bell. Nice jab by Morel. Now, what's your feeling that Morel would dance and run? Well, thus far, not the case. Good combination to the head by Morel. A nice combination working in by but Morel's sitting back, locking, being very patient. Morel wearing the all-white, 31-0, 17 knockouts. Kawicha with the red trim, 20-0 with eight knockouts. Kawicha the number one contender. Morel the champion in his fourth defense. High work rate of the opening round particularly by the champion Morrell. Another left-right combination, not as effective as the earlier one by Morrell. There's a straight right to the forehead by Morrell. Seems to be some blood on Morrell's face. I can't tell where it's coming from. Left eye, I believe, Bobby. Around the left eye. So with about 45 seconds left in the first round, we have a cut. And it's Morrell. 
right hand upstairs by the tie fighter, Cal Witchett. And a pretty jab by Morrell. That's what Morrell needs to do. Step around, step off, give him side to side with him. Use that jab. Hot shot. Pick it, pick a part. Cal Witchett like it's a target. Morrell bouncing around a sharp, accurate puncher with tremendous skills. He does have power. Stop, stop. Don't push his head down. Ten seconds. Wait for the bell. Final seconds of an action-packed first round. Stop at the bell. Stop. We'll follow the champion, Eric Morrell, into the corner. Big first round for Morrell, but a cut. And our translator, Eric Jones. No, don't. Speed, don't blow it. Speed. Oh, dear. Hey, hey. No pitch. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Spit. Most guys coming over your left shoulder. Just as soon as the bell rang, they came right out, and there was a right hand lead by Morrell. Both fighters ready to do battle immediately. And Bobby, apparently not a cut. It is blood from the nose of Eric Morrell. You know, Steve, that's what it appeared to me at first, but I could not see where it was coming from. And as it turns out, he does not have a cut around the eye. He was so soaked in blood around all parts of his face, it was very difficult to tell the initial indication was that it was from a cut around the left eye, but then we obviously realized it was from the nose. The blood from the gloves of Kowichit also obviously rubbing Don't push his head down, down. Don't push his head down. of the champion. And once that blood starts flowing, he can wind up just about anywhere. Round two, scheduled for 12 for the WBA Flyweight Championship. The action intense again, and Kawicha joins in on the corner. Beautiful jab to the nose by Morrell. He rocks him with the right hand now. But Kawicha, undaunted, continues to press forward. Right now, I'm not sure that uh, Eric Morrell was prepared for this stiff of pace. I think he had planned it. Kawich is going to start slow for a few rounds. Kawich's pace now, I think he's maybe confusing Morrell a little bit. He's just playing to start slower. Stop. And Stop. midway through the second Don't round, a furious exchange. Stop. More blood on the left cheek of Morrell, but it's from the nose and the gloves of his opponent. His nose and the gloves of Kawich. Kawich now digging to the ribs. Morrell, no stranger to tie opponents, won the title in 2000 with a convincing decision over previously unbeaten Southpaw, Son Pachai Pizdorachik. Morrell told us he felt Kawichit isn't stronger, but perhaps smarter in the ring than Son Pachai. Well, I'll tell you what, he may not be stronger, but he's shown me great sturdiness, some decent strength, not bad power, very, very steady, keeps his hands up tight, a lot of pressure. He may be a slow starter to to Morrell, but he's a good counterpuncher. He knows how to go to the body. He moves well. But Morrell said, I just don't know how well he takes a punch. Well, so far he hasn't taken that many clean. He covers up better than we might have expected. Keeps his hands high and tight. Locks to the body. And a couple of the punches have got through. And there's been no ill effects. Ten seconds. Stop at the Final bell. second round two. As mentioned, Morrell's big punch the left hook. But he needs to set it up with the jab and his head movement. Stop at the bell. Even the second round after the round controlled the first. And you know what, Jones is happy. I'm not playing, I'm not playing. 
Pero no te suene, no te suene, okay. no te suene. Traga y manda para afuera. Oye, vos, pero ¿qué tal? Si Dame el cubo, para acá, mire, entonces. Traga y escupe, no te, no te suene, por favor. Traga y escupe, respira por favor. Now, which is forcing to stand and fight in certain situations here. You see him applying the pressure, but I think that Morel actually got the better of this exchange on the inside, covering up nicely, working some punches up and inside. But Kawich had applied the pressure that entire round. He was the effective aggressor for the most part of that round. Very close round that could have gone to Kawich. At the end of the round, he was chasing. There's a nice right hand. We chase Morel back to his corner and lands very clean. A very close round I gave to the challenge. Now, which is living up to advertisement, oh, clean that ice. said he will be trading with Morrell. Morrell comes out punching, firing in the third round. And Morrell says, you know what? Kawitsa can talk all he wants, but it's all going to come down to his pure speed and combinations that will slow Kawitsa down. He says this will be over by six. That's Morrell's word. Blood continues to be on the face of Eric Morrell. Blood coming from his nose. Stop! Stop, stop. I don't know if the nose is broken or what, not a doctor, but not looking good. Round three scheduled for 12. See, one of my keys to victory was for Morrell. It's his overall speed, hands and feet, and when he's winning the round, it's because he's using his feet. His feet to get out of the way, like there, at the way, and then his hand That's speed in combination. So that's something we're gonna keep Let watching on as this fight progresses. with the right uppercut. Pick him well, up you know what? And one of the things I thought about would be key for I wish it would be body work to slow down Morel's legs. Maybe weaken him. Now what's it inviting Morel in? He's game. He's playing in the game now too. He's a tough kid. 26 year old from Bangkok, Thailand. He's having fun out there. And he's getting the crowd behind him. Morrell trying to shake off some ring rust as well. Now he is backpedaling. He hasn't fought in nine months, the longest layoff of his career. And we wondered going in if that might be a factor. Now, which it meanwhile, last fought in April. All right, stop! Stop! Break! This is the type of fight where attrition could become a huge factor come rounds 8, 9, 10, and 11. This is a high pace fight, a lot of pressure big bombs being thrown. And many of Kawichik's fights, Bobby, have gone at least 10 rounds or 12 rounds. His very first fight was a 12 rounder. They don't waste time in Thailand. And again, the fact that he had two, right, stop, over 200 stop. Muay Thai fights no, no, no. says volumes about his toughness and durability. And I think that's going to be a big factor as well as his condition. As long as he doesn't start kicking. That would be bad. He said he did do that early in his traditional boxing career out of instinct. A wild left hook there by Kawicha that nailed Morrell and slowed him down momentarily. Morrell's using an awful lot of energy when he retreats, moves side to side with his legs. That could be a factor too as we get laid in the fight. Let him go, Ben. Let him go, Dan. Heading for the bell, round three. Stop! Okay. I'm out of Five. Good, very good. Yeah. Some water, some water. Maybe like that? No, nothing not happened. Very good, very good. Ah. He just hit it. He just hit it. So, put some wrestling on him. Wrestling. In, in, the, in, the box, in the box, in the box, wrestling. Yeah. Make sure they clean the ice off. Yeah, yeah. Eric Morrell told us the left hook right here. His left hand was going to be using his left hand right on the jaw. We're going to see a nice double left hook. He said this is going to be one of his big keys. Banging that left hook, his bread and butter punch. There's the first one. And he'll wait, lock, come back with a second one. Two very nice clean left hooks. Let's go out. End of the round. Morrell is sort of retreating, boxing, trying to get out of harm's way. And to his credit, Kawichi is chasing. Oh. All right, let's go. Our thanks to translator Chuang Eddie Tumkit. 
Coming up, us what uh, Tawichich trainer Sutep Nanakorn was saying in the corner. More and more as this fight unfolds, that jab of Eric Morales is going to become a huge factor. Establishing that jab is going to disrupt the entire rhythm of Kawichi chasing him and score points. Morel left hand happy. We did tell you he has had problems with the right hand. Calcium deposit building up on top of the hand, swelling. He said it's okay heading into this fight. But he says it doesn't matter because the left hook is his big weapon anyway, as Bobby uh, has been pointing out. Stop, stop, break, let's go. Good countering right hand of the chin by Cal Witchett. As this fight been starting to form a pattern, you see that Morell is trying to block and he walks into one. Morell was momentarily staggered. It was a combination of him getting caught with a good punch deep because his legs were not on balance. And I think they kind of crossed feet a little bit. But I'll tell you what, the first round was a close round, but I gave to Morell. The second round, even closer to the challenger, but back to the champion. The champion developing his boxing skills and showing them. And just a note, Bobby, Morell has never been down as a pro or amateur. An illustrious amateur career, but Morell coming back strong now. This attack by Cowichet urging Morell on. Well, he realizes that's his chance. If he can get Morell to stop and stand with him, that's better suited to his style, better suited to his assets. Morell comes from the outside, steps around, and moves jabs. He's going to have problems. Virtually unknown than Housen Cowichet. This guy has more names than losses. It's not uncommon for Thai boxers to reverse their names and take the name of their training gym or their sponsor. So he can go by either Nkausen Kawichit or Kawichit Nkausen. Sometimes he enjoys being called Jim Gray. Uh, that would be interesting. Round four, 30 seconds to go. Again, it's the tie fighter coming forward and belting to the to the midsection. But the, the pace has slowed just a little bit, Steve, because they had an incredible pace. He's still chasing, but a lot less in the way of punches are being thrown by both fighters. Ten seconds, stop at the bell. Final seconds, round four. Big left hook to the ear by Cowichet. Missing with the right. Stop at the bell. Some terrific exchanges here. Stop! That right hand off the shoulder of the ref gives no, no, him a no, big no. smile okay. and a show of respect. Eric, everything all right? Huh? Yeah. Don't play games, right, sir? Be a sportsman. Okay, we're going to watch where that nice stagger was. There you see, it was more of a, actually, if he didn't tangle, but he just slipped out, his right foot slipped out. It wasn't really a stagger, it appeared to be one, but he got hit pretty good. Later on, Morell's trying to step off and bomb from the outside, but he works a nice left hook on the inside as well. Being sharp inside and out, that's his game. Box. Stop, stop, stop. Time. Referee Raul Go with Time. Time. Go over there. Not starting the fifth hey. round. Hey, hey, clean that up. Get a towel and clean this. Come on, Woody. All of that. There's a mess in Cowichet's corner, as you can plainly see. A lot of uh, ice and moisture. And it could be very dangerous if the fighters make their way over to that area. Raul Caiz doing a, uh, helping out there, trying to get the corner to do some housekeeping. First visit ever to the United States for Ben Cowson Cowichet, and he doesn't seem to be fair. First visit for his corner as well, Steve, so they may not have uh, not just the rules, but protocol down back here. Well, having never been to a fight in Thailand, as 
Kowicz and eats a left hand and then invites Morell in for more. But Morell picking his, his spots here. Having never seen a fight in Thailand, I don't know. A noticeable difference like of the pace that Kowicz is able to come forward. He's not working behind the jab as much. And it's hurting him because he's trying to throw big counters from the outside. Morell's too quick for that. Morell very elusive. He, he often turns defense into offense. We haven't seen him switch. Now he does. He switches to Southwood. Just on cue, as I said. He's trying to confuse his opponent. Let him go, Eric. Let him the go. Announcers. Criticisms of Morell is that he has he has been too defensive, too safety first. And um, hands a free punch. Are you seeing any evidence of that? You know, not right now. He's got a guy in front of him who's very aggressive. Who's, he's slowed down some of that aggressive nature by putting the jab in his face and laying some nice two, three, and four punch combinations on Kawichit. But right now, I don't think he's being too cautious. But he's being properly cautious and being smart boxing. <laughs> How about this for press row score? They're all scoring different fights. Carlos Arias from the Orange County Register, Doug Fisher, MaxBoxing.com, Jerry McGee, San Diego Union Tribune. Interesting. Well, I have a 39-37 myself, so it's uh, it's interesting. And I favor uh, the champion Eric Morell. Those scores aren't really off by much. There's, there's, you know, some of these rounds, I can't impress upon people. It's so difficult to score. They're so tight. It's very, very difficult. Carlos Arias giving no rounds to Morell, one even. Doug Fisher giving one to Morell, and McGee four rounds Ten to seconds, Morell. So quite the a uh, disparity there. There's something, there's something wrong in that trio. As we head to the bell for round five. Hands are free. I'm a firm believer they should establish a school for scoring. Oh, okay. Here are Thai transfers. Chu Wang Tunkin. No ice, no ice. No ice, no ice now. Breathing, deep breathing. Go deep, deep breathing. No more. Reach him, reach him, reach him closer and closer. No, no problem, not any problem. Okay. Okay. Deep breathing. Uh, speed up, speed it up. Okay. Yep. No worry, no worry. You see a little clash of the heads right there. Nothing major. Real box from the outside now doing a little switch. There you see him real quick. Just swift switch. Right foot in front, right jabbing now as a southpaw. Very, very brief. Bobby, I don't know if you've noticed, but Kowitschin is being warned at the end of every round as Morrell comes out bombing. He wants to end it right here. He hit Kowitschin with a shot in the temple. Kowitschin just hesitated like he was stunned, and then Morrell unloaded. Powerful shots, and Kowitschin showing his chin in resolve. Kowitschin being warned at the end of every round for fouling, for elbows and butting. So he's going to have to be careful, particularly in a very close fight. I didn't see any blatant elbows in the head, but it's, you know, that, that's a factor that just becomes part of boxing. Uh, sometimes when you play golf, the ball's going to fall into a divot. It just happens. Wild swing and a miss by a cow. Wichita Morell coming out in furious fashion to open round six. It's scheduled for 12 for the WBA Flyweight Championship. Morell the champion in the red, white, and blue, the colors of uh, his native Puerto Rico. The punch that started that sequence that really staggered Kawich, it didn't seem as tough as some of the other blows, not as strong, not as powerful, but I believe when you don't see a punch, it really hurts, and I don't think Kawich saw it. But yet remaining on his feet, he's been down two times in his 20 professional fights. Boy, he almost had Morell off balance there. Kowicz is not working enough now. He's not throwing enough punches, not working behind the jab, not putting enough pressure and hands in the face for Eric Murrell, giving Eric Murrell something to worry about. A rare low. Kowicz tends to lead with a jab or uppercut, which leaves him vulnerable to counter punches. He sort of dips when he jabs and uppercuts as well. We'll see if Morrell can take advantage. See, if you give a fighter with the speed and boxing ability of Eric Morrell time to rest from the outside, He'll pick you apart. This is something Kelwich cannot afford to do. 
Terrell spins Kowichit around and fired a right once again. Kowichit invites Morrell in. Morrell is not fearful of Kowichit's punching power. He only has eight knockouts in 20 fights, which is ironic because he converted to traditional boxing for more time because his manager thought he had punching power, particularly in the right hand. But less than half of his fights are victories by knockout. This is going to be interesting if the fight goes deep because Kowichit has gone 12 rounds on 10 occasions. But he's allowing a big lead now, I think, for Morel. Morel's starting to win these rounds as we get to the middle rounds. This is round Ten seconds, stop five the bell, and round six. And you know what? This is rounds he can't afford to give away, especially if he's going to close. He's got to tire Morel out, not let Morel fight at will. And as you know, though, stop. boxing scoring is so subjective. Our press row judges, though, have it different. Twirling your, your shotgun approach. There you go, Miguel. Watch that early sequence. You see, there, I think he's already, a punch has already been landed. It hurt Kawichit. And now a big left hook and a flurry. Most of those hitting gloves, though, I think that there it would have better behooved Morel to sit, sit on a couple of punches. He just started wailing. And there we see him spinning around, making a nice move defensively, turning Kowichit, and leaving as he wants to. Morel came out frenetically to Pick open the six. Let's see how the seventh begins. A straight right hand that was blocked Again. by the left glove of Kowichit. Kowichit targeting the body. But he can't do that one and done, Steve. That's just not the way. A shorter man, shorter arm, especially a guy that moves and boxes as well as Morel. You need to throw two and three at a time. Morel 5'7", Kowichit 5'3 and a half. And Morel with a three-inch reach advantage. Kowichit just walked in along Morel with a heavy right hand upstairs. Kowichit. And Morel stepped around him nicely, landed a right hand to the temple, which really shook Kowichit up, but he's coming back. Nice uppercut to the midsection by Kowichit. He really is... Courageous. He talked about in the fighter means to cutting the ring off and landing the right hand. He's not cutting the ring off anymore. In the first two rounds, he was doing a good job, really pressing Morel. Now he's just following Morel around a lot. Bobby does blood on one fighter's face influence the judges sometimes? I really don't think so. I really don't think that the blood on anybody's face matters. Since the first round, when blood started flowing from the nose of Morel, his face, for the most part, has been full of blood. Some of it from the gloves of Kowich. As it has rubbed off. Making Morell look like the beaten fighter, although it, from our vantage point, it seems like Morell is ahead. Go on, hold his head, Eric. A little Let bit of blood, especially when it's coming out of the nose, Steve, is completely Stop. irrelevant. Certainly it's not nice, Stop. but it's not a factor whatsoever. As long as the judges understand that, then they know it's coming from the nose and not from another area of the face. It can fool you. You know, it's possible the nose could be broken, but it certainly can affect the breathing because you're trying to breathe through a place that's now full of blood, so there could be a problem there. Then your jaw could be hanging open, and you get that dislocated. When they start sticking the Q-tips up the nose, never a great sign. Here comes Morrell, really pouring it on. Jumping, oh, oh a wicked left hook, but a Raising blow by Morel. That's his punch. Morel's speed and timing now really starting to be a big factor. Morel once again forcing the action. A straight right hand that rocked the challenger. Kowichit's in a little bit of trouble, Steve. Now he looks to jump on him. He's got Kowichit in some difficulty. Stop. And Kowichit Rick. wisely holds Dan, on. You okay? You okay? Trying to buy some time here with 12 seconds to go. The ropes holding him up. 10 seconds up momentarily. Now what's it in trouble? Stop at the bell. Now what's it able okay? to survive? And he's 
Massage him, massage him, give him massage. Yeah, and a deck. Maybe like that? No worry, no worry. Two, two, two. Fight him, fight him, go ahead. No worry, no worry, anything. Give him a massage. So this is make, make a cut punch. Eric Morell using his jab, circling to the right, and watch how it just keeps following him. Doesn't cut the ring off. Jams a little right hand in there. You'll see, throws a nice little right hand in there, and then spins him around. He's gonna Morell's gonna take him and spin him out. There's a nice right hand over the top as well. Followed right behind the jab that dropped. Morell talked about it. He said he drops the jab. I'm gonna follow it right hand all night long. Box. Now it's it surviving a barrage by Morrell toward the end of that seventh round, round eight, scheduled Clean for 12 up, sir, please. with the WBA flyweight crown at stake. The fourth defense for Morrell, wearing the white trunks with the blue and red in front. Kawichit all the way from Thailand, the number one contender in the white with the red trim. If I were Morrell right now, I would test the chin and, and the, you know, jaw and the head area. I would really test it because it seemed to be getting to him toward the end of that round. I don't know that it could totally shake that Kawichit by this time. Well, he's already tested Kawichit's metal, and the, the Thai fighter has passed with flying colors. Nice body work by Kawichit. A borderline low blow right on the belt. Blood continues to come out of the left nostril. Oh, big left hook to the head by Kawichit. Countering right stop, by Morrell, but the punch by Kowitschin, his best of the Deeper, night. Let's go. It was a nice left hook, but Morrell shook it off really well. It is not Kowitschin's power punch. That's the right hand. Pick him up, Dan. Pick him up. He's let's connected go. with a left hook to the jaw. And he's got Morrell thinking a little bit now. A very entertaining uh, fight here at the Anaheim Pond. Right combination to the head by Kowitschik. But Morell's punches sting more. Not only that, but there are more of them. Right. On the way in, Kowitschik lands nice one and gets hit with two or three on the way in. You don't win that way. Yeah, Morell the busier of the two as well. There's a vicious straight right hand that staggers the challenger. You see the knees come out from under Kowitschik. But he continues to fire. And he recovers quickly. And resiliency okay. by okay, okay. There was a nice right hand counter punch by Kawichi again. Morel missed the right hand, and Kawichi rolled on it and fired back well. A rugged performer, and Kausen Kawichi eating a lot of leather here, taking it, and then can, still comes forward. Hands are free, son. Hands are free, Dan. Let him go, Eric! Let him go, Eric. perhaps wondering in his head, what do I have to do to put this guy down? Pick him up, Dan. Pick him up, Dan. Pick him up. Kowitschit by the sixth round. We're already in round eight. Ten Any fighter, as I said bell. before, has been over 200 tie fights, Muay Thai fights. You want to give him some consideration. Well, consider he's a tough guy. I say that because it's not just kickback Stop boxing. It's a very intense, Stop. savage form of kickback. Lucky. Oh, lucky. Oh, in your show. Water. All right. Okay. La pierna, la pierna, eh, la pierna. Oye, dame los ojos a pierna, Miguel. Que me ahí le no me que que. Muy que, man toy me cao, man toy me cao. Yeah, the in the ring there before. Best punch of the night probably for Kowichit. Left hook right over, well-timed shot, right over the low right hand of the champion Eric Morrell. Later in the round, 
Later in the round, a nice right hand right on John. You see the hesitation stagger, and Morell tries to tee off and get him out of there, but I wish it survives. Round nine, scheduled for 12. The challenger, Denkausen Kowichit, showing unbelievable resolve and toughness, but has to be behind on the judges' scorecards. Morell now very confident, dancing away, being elusive, looking to score with the left hook to the head. The right hand over the jab has been working all night. Morell talked about that in the fighter meeting. He said he drops his jab. He said, I'm going to be on top of that with right hand all night long. So far, it's worked. Always good when you get a tape of the fighter. Very difficult to get one out of Thailand. Kowichit with a left hook, but it was blocked by the right glove of Morell. Kowichit not pressing the issue. This is what he needs to do. Hopefully, and wear Morell out and his legs. Maybe take his legs away, but right now he's just not doing it. Apparently, Morell has really slowed the challenger down as we check out press row scoring, which has now come around to Morell, but only by one point by uh, Carlos Arias, two points by Doug Fisher, and uh, our third judge, Jerry McGee, had it by uh, seven points in favor of Morell. I'm going to agree with Mr. McGee. I didn't mean to throw you, Steve, with a little rhyming I thought. Very nice. Very poetic justice. <laughs> but see, this is what is almost now a phone in the rounds before. Morell boxes from the outside area, he switches the southpaw very briefly, but he boxes, and there's, there's no sense of urgency for him because Kowicz is not coming at him. He doesn't have to worry. He can rest when he wants, punch when he wants, and from the outside, Kowicz cannot touch him. Kowicz is doing a little bit of a deep knee bend there to avoid that flurry. Kowichit can dig deep down to get a second win. A glancing blow at that left hook. He missed. Morell smiling. Morell's nose holding up after having difficulty in the opening round. Miguel Diaz is cut, man. Thank you, gentlemen. Boy, there's a great show of respect there after nine rounds. Still to come, our main event here at the Arrowhead Pond. Antonio Margarito defending his WBO welterweight belt against Danny Perez. Let's take into the dressing room of the challenger. That's number three contender, Danny Perez. Local uh, product from right here in California. Won the uh, state junior middleweight crown plus a couple of fringe titles. He's a crowd-pleasing boxer puncher who's won 11 consecutive bouts since losing a close split decision to Margarito back in 99. Moving, moving. Tonight the rematch with a world title on the line, Margarito and Perez. Do it again later in our featured attraction. One little water in the mouth. Of course. All right. And here comes a mouth guard. Here. Eddie, ya vea todo el tiempo, por favor, y crúzalo, papá, y ya vea de nuevo. We head into round 10. As mentioned, Morel had predicted he'd put the challenger away by six. A little more than he bargained for, perhaps, here tonight. No knockdowns as of yet. I think Kowichit similarly predicted that he would stop the champion before we got into the later rounds, too. So neither of them having as much respect in the beginning that maybe have now. I think Morell's prognostication a little stop, more stop. realistic. Deep I think uh, Kowichit was nice just Come on, box. Hopeful, hopeful and, and talking in macho fashion. But as mentioned before, Kowichin in tremendous shape. Morel Camp yelling from the corner, not to blow his nose. 
What happens when you blow your nose when you hit like that is your eyes start to swell up because of the connection of the passages inside your face. A nice right hand to the jaw by Kyle Richard. Every once in a while, Morel does not have his guard up and he gets he gets nailed. Kyle Richard being a little more effective as, as, he, as he's aggressive in this round, but not incredibly so. Kyle Richard, for the most part, really keeps those hands up high. So fast, he's able okay, to penetrate. Break. break! Protect yourself. Let's go. Hands up, hands up, hands up. Hold your hands break. high, then you get hit in the stomach. Hold your hands to the stomach, you get hit in the head. So what do you do? Especially against a very, very fast flamethrower like Morel. Yeah, the speed offensively and defensively, not just with the hands, but with the feet, the movement in, the movement out. It's been real puzzling for Kyle Richard. He has not been able to time him very well. A couple of shots clean, but never a second or third shot. <laughs> and Morello is so fast and elusive. Like, like that. Like there. I love it when these guys go on fuel when we say it's just great. It makes you sound smart. So rare. <laughs> but, it is, yeah, but, but Kyle Wichita's strategy was to go to the body and try to uh, wear Morel down just in case this went into the later rounds and then you go for the head. Came out with the right strategy and started to work early, started to look good, but part of the problem became Morel's accuracy and combinations on the way in. That would just start to wear down because he absorbed a lot on the way in. More than I'm sure he expected to. And that's what Kowicz was trying to do to Morel. Right, stop, 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 Eric. Morel winning stop, that. Me, stop, stop, let's go, box. Under 30 seconds, round 10, scheduled for 12, final fight. Under 12 pounders. I love watching these little guys, oftentimes more action than the, uh, the heavier weight classes. They are crowd pleasers. Not necessarily a bigger bang for your buck, but a whole lot more of it. A lot of action. 10 seconds, stop at the bell. Busy. Particularly Morel. A lot of stop punches bell, thrown. Jim. Stop. Yeah. Yep. Block, block. Block it. Block your hand. No worry. Move, move, move to the left. Move to the left. Everything okay, Dan? Yeah, okay. Come around. Yes. I'm here with her. Okay. Oh, everything okay? Yes. Yeah, Kawichan on the way in, you'll see this hand gets dropped a little low, and the right hand comes right over, and it's right on the mark of Eric Morell. He's got that left hand low. The jab out brings it back low, and it lands right on the jaw. Not incredibly powerful, but one of the better, cleaner shots by the challenger hey, Kawichan. I got it. Morell seeking more worldwide recognition. Feels he just doesn't get water the kind let's of respect All right, let's go. he thinks he deserves. How many times have we heard that with fighters? We hear it over and over. But in this case, it's um, it's true because he is in a lightweight division. It's hard to get a lot of publicity. He, he's been inactive. He hasn't fought in nine months, and he blames that on promoters having difficult times getting the right deals and opponents. And also, the he's been taking heat for not being as aggressive as people would like him to be, but in his last couple of fights, uh, he's forced the action. I thought he's been entertaining. Oh, there's a good left hook by uh, Kowichit, but he hasn't oh, been scoring Break. the knockouts. He's Box. been boxing smart and playing it safe to a degree, and, and you can't fault the man for that. Winning safely is important. Winning is the first thing on the agenda. Kowichit got staggered by one of those right hands. Kowichit is in trouble. He is down for the third time in his career. Three. Seven. And he's got a long way to survive. A minute 50 around 11. Morel being very Stop. patient. Don't push, don't push, don't push. Let's go. Yeah, would you just walked into a left uppercut there too, but tied up the hands and the champion pushed him and he saw him get warned. A flurry by Morel sending the challenger to the canvas. Stop! Separate. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, now. telling Eric Burrell, relax. <laughs> well, eventually, the cumulative effect is taking its toll. Number two, and that's it. Caiz brings it up, and Burrell has his knockout. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah.
Stand up, stand up. Mark! Come on, bring the stool! No, 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 no. It's over in round 11. Raul Caiz said no more than Kausen Kowichin. Come on! And no argument from the Thai corner. The doctor's out there. Here we are, doctor. I want to get him on a stool, make sure he's all right. Look up here. I got it. He took some vicious shots of punishment there in the 11th. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the best. Anybody at 112, 15, won't kill. I can move off tomorrow to fight you. Anybody wants to see. I'm the champ. I'm the best. And this is it. Montiel, para ti. Quiero subir para pelear contigo. Tremenda pelea. Va a ser una tremenda pelea para nosotros. Este, para mi hija, Yalisa, te quiero mucho. Te amo. Para mi mamá, para Freddy, todo el mundo de Madison. I'm the best. So the bilingual Eric Burrell, originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, making his way to Madison, Wisconsin, gives us a little English and the Espanol. He wants to unify, but where are the marquee names? Well, that was a perfect example of a cumulative effect over the course of 10, uh, 11, in the 11th round. Every round, just all those punches. Eventually, the challenger had to succumb. What do you got there? What do you got to say about the running? Took a little longer than perhaps he would like, but he did the job. We'll take a look at the first knockdown. Comes in a nice right hand, more than one, but you'll see a nice right hand right there. Dead in the middle, staggers him, and Morel jumps on him and really keeps the punches clean to the head. Knows how to finish. Here's another look at it. Once he gets back in clean, he sets up a nice right hand down the middle, right there. You see the stagger, you see the legs start to go out from Kawichit. And Morel is right on him, switching a little bit right there to Southpaw, but keeping the punches in the head area where he had hurt Kawichi originally. <laughs> this would be the second and final knockdown. He works a nice left hook to the ear. You can see Kawichi is not right. He doubles the left hook, and that's pretty much it. Speaking of knows how to finish, he said his dream fight would be with junior flyweight and strawweight legend Ricardo Lopez, but highly unlikely uh, due to the announced retirement of Lopez for October the, the 25th. But more realistically, Maybe move up to 118 for I'm perhaps best. Tim Austin. 112, I'm the best. Uh, Eric, here's Ben Carlson. Or even higher to 122 for Bones left. Adams and Paulie Ayala. Like the official word from Jimmy Lennon Jr. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of 1 minute 40 seconds in round number 11. Our referee in charge, Raul Caiz, stops the contest. The winner by way of knockout. He is still undefeated and still the WBA flyweight champion of the world, Eric Little Hands of Steel Morel. His hands were pretty hard. Retains the WBA flyweight title for successful defense. Ups his record to 32 and 0, 18 knockouts. Meanwhile, then Kowsen Kowicz had showed a lot of heart, very game, unsuccessful. His first world title shot, first loss, now 20 and 1. Coming up next, our main event from Anaheim, Antonio Margarito. He is set to defend his WBO welterweight title against Danny Dynamite Perez, a rematch that has the elements of a good one go into the dressing room of the champion and that would be Antonio Margarito at 24 starting to come into his own a former opponent who kept improving and rose to the throne He's fought respectable opposition like Frankie Randall and David Kamau few setbacks early on undefeated his last 18 though Mexico. produced his most impressive performance against his toughest <laughs> opponent when he won the vacant crown his last fight against Antonio Diaz first title defense He'll meet 27 and 2 Danny Perez, who dropped Margarito in the original meeting, although Margarito won. We're set for post fight reaction from our opening bout, so let's swing up to Jim Gray in the ring. Jim? All right, thank you very much. Little hands of steel, Eric. Congratulations to you. Did you break your nose in the first round there? Is it broken? Well, to be honest, I don't even know because I never had this problem before, so I don't even know what a uh, broken nose feels like. But I mean, you know, it's kind of sore right now. But uh, I just, you know, I carry that through round 11 and you saw the uh, results. How would you characterize your performance here tonight? You had not fought in nine months and Cal Wichert was, was very game. Well, it was, it was, I mean, I feel like I had a, I, I did a, a great performance. I feel good throughout the fight. Uh, he was a great, great, great challenger, a strong challenger. I never, I, I wasn't expecting 
that kind of a fight. But hey, like, like a champion that I am, I was ready for it. Uh, I got myself into it. And uh, finally, I took him out in the 11th. Let's take a look at the 11th round. We'll take a look at the first knockdown first. And you can describe the flurry that you put on Cal Wichard right here before he goes down. Well, see, I was, well, he had a, a very slow jab. So I was trying to go on top of it and try to, try to counter that. And that was the right hand that really got it, you know, right in the thing. And uh, everything, every, all the punches, they were like right on the chin, right in the face. And I was trying to, I was trying to hit the right button right there. And then the next knockdown came just a few seconds later. You were able to recognize that he was still the in trouble. Thing. Yeah, the same thing. He threw the jab. I stepped to the side. Well, right there was the uppercut. But see, the, the left hook got in there perfect. And the right hand just straight in. You can't get any fights. A lot of guys uh, avoid you. You're at that awkward crossroads right now. What do you want to do next, Eric? It's up to my promoter, Bob Arum, a top rank. Whatever he want me to do, I will be ready to do any move. If he want me to move up in weight class, if the, you know, the, challenge, the, the, the challenge is right, I'll move up to 115, 118. I'm, I know I'll feel great. And um, yeah, that's about it, man. 118 or 122 as well? Oh, uh, 115, 118, 122. 122, I'm probably going to have to wait a little longer because I got to get used to it. At first, you know, first of all, to fight at 118. I fought 115 before, so I, f I feel pretty strong at that weight class. 118, you know, I'm probably going to take, you know, I, I would take a few months and then move up to 122. Up to my promoter, whatever he want me to do. Eric, uh, show the fans your right hand. You've had some calcium deposits. It looks a little swollen tonight. Is it all right? No, my right hand feels great. I mean, I'm, I, I didn't have any problems with it. Uh, as you can see, that was the punch that sent, sent him down, and I didn't, have any, I didn't feel any pain through, throughout the fight. So the right hand, uh, I, I, you know, I think the layoff did a lot to it, and the uh, right hand is great. I mean, right, right hand is great, and hey, I'm, I'm ready for the next one. All right, Eric, we look forward to seeing it. Congratulations. Thanks a lot, and my daughter, Jalisa, three months old, I love you, baby. That, that fight was for you. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. Steve, back down to you. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. And we want to remind 